All right, so it looks like we're broadcasting live. So welcome today to Becoming Supernatural. We are now at chapter eight. Congratulations, you have made it to the 50% mark in the book. There's only 14 chapters in the book and we are now in chapter right, eight. So it looks like we're broadcasting live. So, Oops, sorry for that. Okay, so as I was saying, Congratulations, you've made it to the 50% mark. We're halfway through the book. Out of 14 chapters, we are currently on chapter eight. So that's the good news. So let's get started, let's dive in deep. Chapter eight is about mind movies and the kaleidoscope. So I had just finished a keynote lecture on a Saturday night in Orlando, Florida. And the following morning, while packing my bags in preparation for my afternoon flight home, I turned on the television to catch up on the political situation in the United States. It was in the thick of the 2016 presidential election. And since I had been out of the country traveling and lecturing over the previous three weeks, I was curious about what had transpired during my time away. I quickly surfed through the channels to find a news station set the remote down and while halfway paying attention to the TV, I continued packing. Suddenly, a commercial came on that caught all my attention. And in an instant, I understood why we called it television programming. The commercial began with a nighttime exterior shot of a couple's home. And as the camera zooms in on the house, the words, Night number 14 with shingles appear on the screen. When the shot moves to the interior, tender yet foreboding music plays while an elderly man moans in pain at the foot of his bed. His concerned wife enters the room and asks him how he's doing. It hurts, he replies. In the lower right corner in a tiny font, almost the same color as the background, are the words actor portrayal. The wife walks over with a look of despair and slowly lifts her hand's shirt revealing huge red scabbed lesions covering more than half his lower back. The image is shocking, grotesque, horrific, looking like nothing less than a large third degree burn. So in my 31 years of practice, I've examined hundreds of people with shingles and have never seen anything that looks so severe as the manufactured lesions in this commercial. I immediately knew it was designed to evoke a strong emotional response with the viewing audience, because it certainly did in me. So once you see the rash on the man's back, the commercial achieves its goal of commanding your attention. Because the portrayal of the rash is so arresting, it changes the way you, you were feeling from only a moment before your, present, before your present state of watching it. So the moment the commercial significantly changes your internal emotional state, it causes you to put more of your attention and awareness on the source of the disruption in your external environment. So the stronger the emotion it causes, the stimulus, the more you lean in and pay attention, your response. This association of stimulus and response or conditioning is how long-term or associative memories are created. So this process of conditioning begins by pairing a symbol or an image with a change in an emotional state, a combination that opens the doorway between the conscious and the subconscious mind. And in the case of Shingles commercial, now that they have captured all your attention and begun the programming process, you can't help but naturally wonder what they're about to say next. So the commercial continues with a somber male narrator. If you've ever had chicken pox, the Shingles virus is already inside you. As you get older, your immune system weakens and it loses its ability to keep the shingles virus in check by using emotional branding. This is the first instance where the commercial raises ethical questions by telling the audience that the immune system weakens with age. Next, 
we see the man in the bathroom look at, looking at himself in the mirror. He looks worried, broken, and defeated. The scene changes to his wife talking on the phone in the kitchen. I just can't stand seeing him like this, she says. Next, we see the man doubled over on his bed, palm to the forehead, wincing in pain. And the narrator then makes a direct suggestion, reinforced by the same words appearing on the screen. One in three people will get shingles in their lifetime. The narrator continues while the same words remain on the screen. The shingles rash can last up to 30 days. The scene cuts to his wife pleading directly into the camera. I just wish there was something I could do to help. Again, we see the man in pain. And on the screen appear the words, one in five people with shingles will have long-term nerve pain. These words remain on the screen for the remaining narration, which says, some people with shingles will have long-term nerve pain, which can last a few months to a few years. Don't wait until someone you love develops shingles. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist about your risk. So let's take a closer look at what this commercial is attempting to do. First, it puts you in an emotional state by changing how you feel. Once it captures your attention, you immediately become more open and suggestible to the information that follows. Now that you're more prone to accept, believe, and surrender to this information without analyzing it, if you're feeling fearful, victimized, vulnerable, worried, shocked, weak, tired, or in pain, you're going to be more susceptible to the information equal to those emotions. I'm going to read that again. So now that you're more prone to accept, believe, and surrender to this information without analyzing it, if you're feeling fearful, victimized, vulnerable, worried, shocked, weak, tired, or in pain, you are more susceptible to the information equal to those emotions. So you might start wondering if the ailment happened to you. At various points during the commercial, certain facts appear written on the screen, allowing you to read along. This serves to reinforce the programming. Also, while the thinking brain is focused on reading the copy, the content of the narration slips behind the conscious mind and into the subconscious mind. Like an audio recorder, it records the entire script and creates an internal program. So next, through a direct literal suggestion, the narrator has, has instilled fear in you by personally suggesting you already have the shingles virus in your body and that because of the natural process of aging, your immune system is no longer strong enough to take care of the virus. And I'll read that once again. Next, through a direct literal suggestion, the narrator has instilled fear in you by personally suggesting you already have the shingles virus in your body and that because of the natural process of aging, your immune system is no longer strong enough to take care of the virus. This turns on your emotional brain, the seat of your nervous autonomic nervous system, allowing it to become programmed. Once the suggestions make it into your autonomic nervous system, it takes the orders without question and gets busy making chemical changes in your body equal to the literal suggestions. So in other words, your body is going to be subconsciously and automatically be programmed to weaken your immune function. In conclusion, you're at risk and you better not wait until you contract it. I'm gonna pause right here. First two times I read this book, I didn't catch this and I just caught it. And I told you in our earlier broadcasts that we have words that are giving us clues, that we have hidden secrets that are in the words themselves, but we unaware, gloss over, paint by, not recognizing what the words actually mean and the inherent secret and wisdom that are in the words. So I just read to you, in conclusion, you're at risk and you'd better not wait until you contract it. This is no accident. This is no, well, maybe it is a coincidence that 
I'm noticing it now and that you happen to be watching this video at this particular point in time, because make no mistakes, we knowingly and unknowingly, consciously and unconsciously make contracts all the time. We put the order in to our brain, our subconscious mind listens to anything and everything without discrimination, 100% of the information goes in, and then it acts on that contract once you let it go. Whether you're aware or unaware, that subconscious mind is like a recorder that was turned on at birth and doesn't turn off until death. It's a contract, it's an agreement. But the good news is that becoming supernatural is giving you the tools so that you can be empowered by putting your hands on the steering wheel. And now you can use your awareness and focus to decide I'm gonna turn left on purpose now, or I'm gonna turn right. I'm gonna signal my autonomic nervous system to fire and wire, to upregulate or downregulate the expression of the wanted that I want in my genes. Anything that's unwanted, I can flip the switches off by commanding my autonomic nervous system. You don't need to know the chemistry. You don't need to know what chemicals. All you need to do is give the command that you want your autonomic nervous system to fire and wire and to create any combination of the 140,000 proteins and chemicals that your body creates, it'll know exactly what combination needs to be done to now turn off the gene expression for diabetes, Parkinson's, the flu, any, any expression of any kind of disease, or if you've been in a traumatic, uh, you know, accident where you have an injury, you know, like I did, I was hit by a bus and it's taken a long time. I'm probably like, I still have, I'd say maybe 85%. I've got about 85% healed, but I still probably have another 15% to go. But the bottom line is whether it's a physical trauma due to an accident of any kind of sort, whether it's a, a trauma due to an emotional or a spiritual or a psychological event, like we read about Anna in the first chapter, who, who eventually that trauma led to hor horrible cancer. And she was able to turn it around as we saw. So it doesn't matter that infinite source intelligence knows exactly. All you have to say is, I want health. I want to optimize my body. You don't focus on the cancer. You don't focus on the neurological disorder. You don't cause, focus on the pain that's already in your body. You focus on, I wanna turn my autonomic nervous system on to produce whatever pharmacopoeia, whatever combination of chemicals is necessary to optimize my body so that I am in this wonderful, energetic, beautiful feeling in my body where I feel rejuvenated. I feel energized. I feel happy. I feel I'm continuing to magnify the love and it's spreading from my heart space. And then you let it go. So you're at risk and you better not wait until you contract it to contract a disease. You're actually making a contract. So I think that's very powerful to take note of that. That That is, I think, giving you control of the steering wheel, knowing now, oh my gosh, I have control of the steering wheel of this vehicle. And I thought I was operating with a 300 horse, horsepower machine and come to find out it's 500 horsepower Ferrari. Yeah, make no mistakes. That's exactly what you have in, on your hands that you have access to 24-7. You've always had it. That's the cool thing. So the commercial, the commercial's effect goes even a little further. If you've ever had chicken pox and after watching this, you think your immune system is weak because of your age, you will decide you have an even greater need to prevent getting these shingles. So you will even be more motivated to buy the drug. Period. I'm just going to say, sounds like manipulation by the commercial, doesn't it? I said, it sounds like it. So if you happen to be a person who has shingles and you're watching this commercial, when you see that your condition is not as severe as the actor's shingles, you may think, and you might find yourself thinking, 
hmm, well, maybe I should take the drug now so that it doesn't get any worse. Or I don't want to end up like him. Or if you don't have the shingles at the commercial's end, you may still be left quietly wondering, am I part of the two thirds of the population that is sick? Or am I in the one third of the population that will get the virus? If you think, I hope I'm not part of the one third, it means you believe that there may be a chance that you're susceptible and vulnerable, leaving you unconsciously thinking that you already have it. So you know what I found most absurd about this commercial? They never even mention a drug, which means they don't have to reveal its side effects. Isn't that convenient? And since the commercial had now piqued my curiosity, I had stopped packing and had looked on the internet for another commercial by the same pharmaceutical company. I wanted to know what drug they were suggesting would alleviate the severity of the actor's exaggerated manufactured lesions. So after a quick search, I found several similar commercials with, this, with the same theme and wording, but with slight variations. They all shared one thing in common. However, they were all designed to capture your attention. So in the next commercial, I watched a woman and she's wearing goggles and swimming in a lap pool. Everything is black and white. And in a twist on the previous commercial, the narrator speaking in an authoritative female British accent is the shingles virus and the narration is coming from within the woman's head. Impressive, Linda. Age isn't slowing you down, but your immune system weakens as you get older, increasing the risk for me, the shingles virus. I've been lurking inside you since you had chicken pox. I could surface at any time as a painful blistering rash. The scene then abruptly black and white to color, and a man lifts his shirt to reveal the worst shingles rash you've ever seen. Again, the grotesque blistering lesion can't help but attract your attention. It's kind of like a car wreck. You know, you drive by and you're kind of like this. You don't want to look, but you want to look, but you don't want to look. Kind of afraid to see what you're going to see, but you got to see. Same kind of emotional effect. So again, as quickly as the scene turns to color, it returns to the swimmer in black and white. So the commercial continues in a similar manner and the formula as the previous one, first make an arresting statement or show a shocking image to change the viewer's emotional state, then cause them to be more suggestible to the information via the change in their emotional state. And then finally use auto-suggestion to make them wonder if they already have the disease, the shingles. I'm gonna pause here because you could put whatever, it doesn't have to be that particular ailment, it could be anything. I mean, anything without regard. So bear that in mind. So this ad infers that even though you might be healthy, work out and take care of yourself, you can still become a victim of the virus, further suggesting that no one is immune. Again, the words on the screen reinforce the message, one in three people get me in their lifetime, Linda. Will it be you? If you identify with the woman in any manner, the voice is talking directly to you. The tone of the commercial then changes as a new male narrator begins speaking in a confident, lighthearted tone, devoid of worry or concern. In a similar British accent, the voice says, and that's why Linda got me drug X. The scene remains in the black and white, except for the woman's bathing suit, her swim cap, and the name of the drug, which appears on the screen in a large, sophisticated font. Now, the drug has been imprinted into your brain at yet another level. Once again, the ad has created an association between your health and safety and the drug that will protect you. The tagline comes on the screen as the narrator reads it aloud, stating that the drug helps you to boost your immune system against shingles, to help protect you against you, the shingles. At the end of the commercial, that narrator says, Drug X is used to prevent shingles in adults 50 years or older. The drug is not to be used to treat shingles and it does not help everyone. So here's the punchline. You should not take the drug if you have a weakened immune system. 
Whoa, what backup? Here's the irony. They just told you that as you age, your immune system weakens and you're at a greater risk for shingles. The drug is supposed to strengthen your immune system, but you shouldn't use it if you have a weakened immune system. So now comes the dilemma. If you still choose to take the drug, you believe the drug to be more powerful than your possibly weakened immune system, the programming worked. What the clever, if not unethical, advertisers understand is that this messaging is confusing and disorienting to your conscious mind. At the same time, however, they are programming your subconscious mind with the idea that your immune system is weak. You probably already have the virus within you and chances are high that you'll get shingles even if you are healthy. In addition, you are told that without medication, you're likely to suffer, suffer even though there's no guarantee that the shingles will go away easily and that it still might not work if your immune system is weak. Finally, come the side effects, which are not side effects, but direct effects. Quote, a shingles like rash, redness, pain, itching, swelling, hard lumps, warmth, bruising or swelling at the injection site and headache. Talk to your doctor if you plan to be around newborns or people who are pregnant or who have a weakened immune system because the vaccine has a weakened version of the chickenpox virus and you could infect them. Wow. I started to wonder what planet I was living on. This type of programming makes you wonder if we really have free will or if we're all making choices based on what we've been conditioned to believe is the answer. Whether that's a certain type of beer, shampoo, or conditioner, the latest smartphone or a pill that may or may not provide relief from the shingles virus you may or may not even have. Most of the time, advertising appeals to lack and separation by reminding you to want what you don't have, to desire what you need to fit into a social consciousness, or satiate a feeling of emptiness or loneliness. And of course, in this case, if you're sick or feeling like you're sick, the advertiser has the answer to your symptoms. So in one final search, I came across a similar commercial with the same theme, an actor dramatically suffering for 17 days, the shocking exposure of a huge legion and words on the screen to influence the viewer's thoughts while reinforcing the same content. Like the other commercials, this one explicitly informs the public that the drug is not used to treat shingles. But at the end of the commercial, the handsome, handsome man smiles and declares, I think I'm going to give it a try. Meanwhile, I'm left wondering why he would give it a try if he already has had the shingles for 17 days especially if the drug doesn't treat the condition. Now I'm really confused. Years ago, I learned in my training that by definition, hypnosis is a disorientation of the in inhibitory processes of the conscious mind, bypassing the analytical mind so that one becomes highly responsive to suggestions and information in the subconscious mind. As the subconscious mind is busy and preoccupied trying to figure things out, the subconscious mind takes it all in without any kind of discretion. And if you can disorient people with information, or in today's world, disinformation, like that, shock or confusion, you just open the door to programming their subconscious mind. So in this chapter, we're going to learn how to do the opposite and positively program, reprogram the negative programming we've been conditioned to for most of our lives. Okay, next section. Three minds in one brain, the conscious, subconscious, and analytical mind. So by now you know 
that when you change your brain waves from beta and alpha, you slow down the neocortex and the analytical thinking brain. And as your brain waves slow down, you leave the domain of the conscious mind and enter the realm of the subconscious mind. We could say then that if you are somewhat conscious and aware, but not actively engaged in your thought, your consciousness is moving out of the thinking neocortex and entering into the midbrain, otherwise known as the subconscious, the home to the autonomic nervous system and the cerebellum. Okay, I'm gonna pause right here. So one of the things that if you don't know yet, you probably have put two and two together as you followed along from chapter one up until now, that really the key of your health is your autonomic nervous system, but your autonomic nervous system has to be told what to do. So this is what I think where Dr. Joe Dispenza, he hits a home run, he knocks it out of the park, not just because what I've said in the past where he integrates the mystical teachings as well as science and he dovetails them together so that they're integrated so that one supports the other. They're basically the same thing, but you have the language of mysticism and all the different ancient teachings and then you have science. Science is what maximum of 300 years old. The teachings of what the ancient mystics have known lasts, you know, I would say 15,000 years because we have documented evidence of humans being on planet Earth as long as 15,000 years ago. And I think I mentioned before, in case you missed it in the previous broadcast, you know, they found a skull here, not too far, Laguna Beach, which is just a couple beaches down from me. They found a skull off of Sandy Canyon Road of an Indian woman that existed 15,000 years ago. They discovered it in 19... I want to say 07, 08, 09, it was at the turn of the century. They also found another skull of another Indian woman right here off the coast of California in Ventura. And it was a Chumash Indian woman. And, um, and that I believe was, I think 9,000 years ago, some, something that's circa that. I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly, but it was in that ballpark. So the bottom line is that where Dr. Joe hits that out of the ballpark is that he teaches you how to differentiate. I think most of us, I think, you know, you know what it is to be conscious and what it is unconscious. You know, you go to sleep, you're unconscious. When you're awake, you're conscious. Um, we're all aware that as we are operating our days on a day-to-day -day basis, you have a conscious mind where there are the things that you know by rote that you learned in school, that you were conditioned by your, your parents, your peers, your home, family environment, your neighborhood, the TV shows that you watch, the books that you read, all the external out, you know, external outer environmental things that you took in and stored them as needed into your subconscious. And then your subconscious, just like your computer has a bunch of programs that are running in the background, whether you think you need them or not, same thing is true with your subconscious mind. All that programming is in your subconscious mind. It's a tape recorder. It's recording everything, no matter what. It doesn't discriminate, it doesn't care. Your conscious and your subconscious are recording everything, every life event, every bit of information you take in, every feeling that you take in, every emotion, every trigger. It records everything without discriminating. It's, it's business is just to be on. Your brain records that as the organ, and then it neurosomatically stores the information in your, not only your subconscious mind, which keeps everything, keeps a record of everything, but your brain also sends the signals where in your body to neurosomatically file away those experiences, especially if they're emotional, emotional responses that are very happy, elated, joyous, fun-filled, laughing, those good memories. You feel it in a certain part of your body. And if it's a negative traumatic, horrifying, terrifying, scary, fearful, angering, raging type of emotion, shocking, um, paralyzing emotion, it lodges that into your body too. It lodges it literally neurosomatically, which means that neurotropically, neuroenzymatically, neuro um, physically, depending on where your placement is in terms of your body placement in towards the, that experience, that's where your proprioceptor system kicks in and it'll go, okay, the trauma 
for an, for an example, you know, if you're in an accident and you get hit from the left side of your car, then you're neurosomatically because the impact came from the left side, your brain is going to, to file that not only into your memory bank and your subconscious mind, but it's also going to file that neurologically onto the left side of your body affecting, uh, sometimes it crosses over to the opposite side. So you might have a right shoulder, you might have left shoulder pain, but you might have corresponding right shoulder pain because there are times where this is kind of getting more technical than probably you guys want to get into. But the bottom line is that it's going to file that experience from the left. No different than, let's say, let's change it instead of a car accident. Let's change it to a parent-child relationship. We all had parents. We all had adults that took care, took care of us when we were children. If you had teacher, parent, let's say a much older sibling that, um, you know, you sat as a five-year-old child, six-year-old child, and maybe they, for the first time ever in your life, all of a sudden screamed at you in a rage. And let's say that that person was wearing an orange shirt, just as an example. And all of a sudden you were horrified and you were paralyzed in fear so much so that because it was such a shock to your body, because maybe this person had never, or no one in your life had ever behaved this way with you that is going to impact the left side of your body. You may unconsciously develop an aversion to the color orange and anything having to do with the color or orange moving forward. And not that that's not the only thing, but because this happened on the left-hand side, this in your subconscious is still running as an operating program that's on the, in the front left-hand side of the motion picture screen of your mind as your memory recalls it and as your body feels it it's pulled up having a bigger brunt of the energy coming at you on the left side as opposed to the right side because the person stood on the left side to you that's part of that neuro health reset that i do we take into account all those different uh, systems of the body so dr joe helps us differentiate between our conscious mind our brain, you know, you have the organ of the brain itself. You have the ego, appears much bigger. I would say it, it, it often masquerades as it being us as our true self, and it's not. So you have the ego, you have the brain, and then you have your conscious mind. And then once you can differentiate those, those three things and how the brain operates to give commands to the body, no different than your computer. When you are on your computer and you do control C, it copies whatever command you give it to, your computer will do it. The same thing with your brain. Your brain is just recording everything and taking the commands. If your ego is, is saying, you know, freak out, fight or flight, then it'll automatically do that. Okay. So moving forward, if you ever, okay, so if you've ever witnessed someone completely captivated by a television show, so much so that when you tried to speak to them, they didn't even hear you, it's possible that they were experiencing alpha brainwave states, a state highly suggestible to information. Suggestibility is the ability to accept, believe, and surrender to information without analyzing it. So in this state, the viewer is so engrossed, so focused, with what they're watching, that they appear entranced and motionless. Nothing else seems to exist to them except the object of their attention. So if the person doesn't analyze the information they're being exposed to, they are likely to accept, believe, and or surrender to it because there's no analytical filter. So it makes logical sense then that the more suggestible you are, the less analytical you are. The opposite is also true. The more analytical you are, the less suggestible you are to information. Therefore, it is less likely that your brain will be in alpha brainwave or trans state. So let's take a look at figure 8.1 to help you understand the relationship between suggestibility, the analytical mind, trans, and brainwaves. So if you have a book, go to that figure 
8.1. So as your brain waves slow down and you get beyond your analytical mind, your brain waves move into trans and you're more suggestible to information. So the inverse is also true. As your brain waves speed up, you become more analytical and the brain moves out of trans and you become less suggestible to information. Suggestibility is your ability to accept, believe, and surrender to information without analyzing it. So what the creators of these commercials I mentioned earlier fully understand is that the best way to program a person to take a desired action is to put them into an alpha brainwave state so that the information presented is not analyzed. So when the commercial is repeated, or a similar one with the same message is played over and over, sooner or later the program is going to enter the viewer's subconscious mind. And the more we are exposed to the stimulus, in this case the commercial, the more automatic the programmed response becomes. Eventually, when we've unconsciously memorized the stimulus and the response is automatic, the conscious mind no longer needs to think about or analyze the incoming information. Meanwhile, the subconscious mind maps the information, recording and storing it like a voice or a video recording. Once it is mapped into the brain, each time you are exposed to the commercial, it continues to prime the same neural networks, further reinforcing the same program, thought and belief. Now, not only can information influence your health, but it can also give you the solution to the problem the commercial is actually creating. I'm going to stop right here because now not only can information influence your health, but it can also give you the solution to the problem the commercial is actually creating. I don't know about you guys, but doesn't that sound like abuse? Where an abuse causes pain and trauma on you, and then after they have hit you, beat you, wounded you physically, emotionally, spiritually, energetically, then when you're finally broken down, they show you affection and try to comfort you and promise you they'll never do it again. It's like they now want to be the hero and um, rescue you from the harm that they created. It's sick, but it's the same pattern. It's the exact same pattern. It's no different. I have said for years, and one of the things that I did as I trained the agents and brokers that worked for me over the last 20 plus years is that people respond in predictable ways. Human beings, why? Because we all have brains, we have a heart, we have a certain neuro neurology, a neurophysiology, neuroimmunology, neuros. We're not going to get into all the different neuros, but neurochemically, people are all the same. The way the brain stores information, the way the, the brain responds in, in the advent of something fearful or threatening or a crisis, we're all hardwired the same in that. So as a result, this is showing you, it doesn't matter what country from, you're from. It doesn't matter how tall, how short, how big, how fat, how, none of that matters. If you're a human being, people respond in predictable ways. And because of that, that's why this television programming works. Okay, moving on. Other situations that increase suggestibility, including shock, trauma, or a strong emotional reaction. So for instance, when people are stunned or exposed to emotionally charged situations, it's common that the brain goes into an altered state as the brain pauses because of a sensory overload, such as a motor vehicle accident, the person enters a suggestible state. In severe cases, the person surrenders to the shock becomes frozen and numb, and their ability to think becomes impaired. Therefore, when someone is exposed to an, an, ex to an aggressive rash 
and feels sickened by the images combined with the right music and narration to create an ominous or foreboding mode, the door to the subconscious mind opens, making the person more easily programmable. So if you remember, the subconscious mind sits right below the conscious mind and the limbic brain is the home of the subconscious and the autonomic nervous system, which controls all the autonomic and automatic biological functions that happen on a moment to moment basis. I'm going to pause right here. You have the autonomic nervous system, which is the word autonomic is synonymous with automatic in case anyone was wondering out there. Okay. Once thought is programmed like a servant carrying out their master's orders, the ANS carries out the request of the thought. And if you repeatedly told that your immune system weakens as you age and that one out of three people who have had chicken pox in their life will get shingles, the emotionally charged experience allows the message to make it past your thinking analytical mind. So in response to this information, your ANS, your autonomic nervous system, follows the orders and can begin to actually weaken your intent, internal defense system. So we don't want that. We want to cancel that out. We want to command our brain. Nope, autonomic nervous system, do as I say. I'm the master. You're the servant. I command you to optimize my body, to strengthen my immune system, to optimize it, make it as healthy and energetic and rejuvenated as possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. For the advertisers to really get their money's worth in this commercial endeavor, it's best for them to repeatedly run the commercials late in the evening when we are most suggestible to programming. Why? Because melatonin levels rise in response to darkness and melatonin causes our brain waves to slow down in preparation for sleeping and dreaming. So because our brain waves are moving from beta to alpha to theta to delta in the evening, people are less analytical and their subconscious window opens. As a daylight wakes up in the morning and our brain begins to produce serotonin, the reverse process occurs. Our brain waves go from delta to theta to alpha, where again, our subconscious opens to programming and eventually to beta. So if you're an advertiser and you know that the majority of the public is not aware of the way the subconscious programming works, why not create a series of late night commercials with your desired messaging accented with just the right amount of fright and concern so as to capture the viewer's attention and proceed to program their autonomic nervous system to get busy taking the orders just before they fall asleep. A good rule of thumb, don't watch anything on television or on the internet or participate in any mode of entertainment that you don't want to experience, not only before bed, but ever. I agree. That's why I don't watch any high body count movies. Never, ever, ever in my life have I watched any thrillers. That's not the, you know, garbage in, garbage out. It's not the kind of stuff that I want my brain to be programmed with. And I don't want those images. I'm very visual. So I don't want those images replaying over and over again. You know, it hurts. So why would you do that? So kaleidoscope eyes entranced in a trance. So for years, I've been thinking about how we're all constantly programmed into self-limited beliefs. And that is believing that we need something outside of us to change how we feel inside of us. So this is after all what advertising is all about, the never ending dependence on and consumption of external sources to make us feel happy or better. This belief, which reminds us of our separation from wholeness is incessantly ingrained in us through the media, television shows, commercials, the news, video games, websites, and sometimes even music. So simple strategy real. Really, so if you can suspend people with feelings of lack, fear, anger, opposition, prejudice, pain, sadness, and anxiety, they remain dependent on someone or something outside of themselves to make those feelings go away. So if you remain in a perpetual state of busyness and are always preoccupied in your survival emotions, 
you never actually have the opportunity to believe in yourself. I highlighted this in the book. Oh, you can't see the color on the screen, but I have that highlighted, so I'm going to read it again because it's very, very, very important. And I hope if you have a book that you take your highlighter and you highlight it too. So if if you remain in a perpetual state of busyness and are always preoccupied in survival emotions, you never actually have the opportunity to believe in yourself. Imagine that. But what if it was possible to undo or reverse that programming so you had unlimited beliefs about yourself and your life? That's exactly what we've been doing for several years at our advanced workshops using two simple tools, including one that children have been playing with for ages, a kaleidoscope. And the only difference is that we're applying it in a technologically advanced way to induce trans. So up until this point, we've been moving into trans and alpha theta brain waves with our eyes closed during a meditation. But if we can create alpha and even theta brainwave states with our eyes open and intentionally expose ourselves to information relevant to our lives, dreams, and goals, we can reprogram ourselves into supernatural states rather than the unconscious states we experience daily. But why the kaleidoscope? Well, for many years now, my primary passion has been the mystical. So each time I have one of these profound and super lucid experiences, they create lasting changes within me that deepen my understanding of myself and my connection to the mystery of life. So once you have a mystical experience and get your first glance behind the veil, you can never go back to business as usual. And with every subsequent mystical experience you have, you move closer to source wholeness, oneness, and the indivisible unified field. The good news is that mystical experiences are no longer related to people like Teresa of Avila, Francis of Assisi, or a Buddhist monk who's been meditating for 40 years. Every person is capable of engaging, experiencing, and accessing the mystical. So when I'm having a mystical experience, it seems more real to me than anything I have ever known in my life. And I lose track of space and time. Often, just before I become entwined in it, I see in my mind and sometimes, sometimes in my outer world, circular geometric patterns made of light and energy. They tend to look like mandalas, except they're not static. They're standing waves of interfering frequencies that appear as fractal patterns. The only way I can describe their properties is that they are alive, moving, changing, and ever evolving into more complex patterns within patterns. Okay, so I'm gonna share from my, um, from my own particular um, experience and mystical experiences. So if any of you guys are interested, you can check out under Love and Money Secrets TV. I do have, on March 22nd, I had a really, I, a really profound mystical experience where a lot of things happened and I went into different dimensions and, and it was just uh, out of this world, um, spectacular experience. And I knew that I was changed after that particular mystical experience because of how I experienced it. So um, he mentions here about those fractal patterns. He mentions that his are circular, not mine, I've had circular ones, but I have a lot of them that are um, like they're moving squares that are multidimensional. It's kind of hard to describe because we don't see it in, in the 3D world. There's nothing like this that, um, that exists. So um, it's kind of like, if you will, like an undulating 3D holographic fractal pattern, geometrical form with very specific colors throughout this thing. But it's kind of like a moving energetic thing. So it may not look like either of those two things. You may see something else with some sort of fractal, symmetrical, moving energy type of form in your experience. But what I learned from Dr. Joe, because I would see those, but I didn't know. I thought, oh, you know, it's entertaining to watch as you're meditating. You're like, ooh, look at the pretty 
colors and the moving energy and, and that, but I didn't realize that those are packets of information. And as you allow yourself, like if you try to look anything in meditation, <laughs> anything in meditation that you try to take a closer look at, it goes away which is very frustrating because when you see something that spectacular, you want to take a closer, clearer look and just you're trying to take a closer look, it dissolves and it goes away and it never comes back. So that opportunity is lost, which is so frustrating. So what I learned is that you have to let go. The way you're seeing it is the way you're seeing it. It's good enough. Just allow yourself to just be there. Just stay in that state. Just even say, I allow, I surrender, I let go, I feel fine. And then, and then it will continue to unpack. And then from there, I guess there's a download of information that happens that then you're able to go to the next level or the next whatever. You can get past, past it where now you benefit where that packet of information is now converted into more specific imagery and dimensions you actually go go someplace you don't know i mean i don't know when when i've gone to places i have no idea sometimes i go to places and i have no idea where i went to i was gone for how long i don't know sometimes i don't remember hardly anything other than i was gone far far away there's sometimes you go through like a I don't want to call it a tube because it's not a tube, it's maybe kind of a portal. But everybody's experience is different. You know, my what I experienced, what I saw, what I felt um, is going to be entirely different from somebody else. And that's all fine. It's all good. You know, the infinite source intelligence, it knows exactly what it is that we need and how we are best going to receive whatever that intelligence and whatever that information is. And it's going to incubate what you don't need to know in this moment. It'll just bubble up what you need to know now. And then the other things will, you will have received them and they're going to pop up at just the right time. So you can't, you can't get in the way of this. You can't screw it up. The only way you can get away with, get in the way of this is if you try to make something happen or if you're afraid. Trying to see something more in meditation takes you right out. Being afraid because the divine energy that is infinite source intelligence. You have free will. If you're afraid and you don't want to go any further, as soon as you are afraid, it retreats because it doesn't want to put you in fear. It is love. So in order for you to continue the walk with it, you have to be love to match with its love. And then you can further the walk together. If you're in love and the divine is in love, and now all of a sudden you have fear, then the divine loves you so much that it doesn't want you to be afraid. It wants you to be in love. So it will retreat to allow you to balance yourself again so that you can get into a place of love and re-engage. Does that make sense? Gee whiz, never language it that way, but I thought that was pretty cool. Okay. So often just before I became entwined in it, I see in my mind and sometimes in my outer world circular geometrical patterns made of light and energy, and they tend to look like mandalas, except they're not static. They're standing waves of interfering frequencies that appear as fractal patterns. The only way I can describe their properties is that they are alive, moving, changing, and ever evolving into more complex patterns within patterns. These patterns look like what you see when you look into a kaleidoscope. But instead of being two-dimensional, they're three-dimensional. I would say they're multi-dimensional. When I see the rest of my attention, so when I see and rest my attention on these divine geometric patterns, they change. And I know in a moment as my brain takes the pattern of information and transduces it into a vivid imagery, I'm about to have a profound mystical experience. That's why my team and I wanted to create a kaleidoscope visual for my students to hopefully induce those type of experiences. But we couldn't find any real footage of a kaleidoscope. So at the time, all the fractal geometry media files on the internet were computer generated, and I wanted to create a more realistic representation. So after much searching, my team and I found a family that has been making kaleidoscopes for nearly three generations. So we bought one of their best pieces. 
So next, you rented a camera by RED, the leading manufacturer of professional digital cinema cameras, most often used in Hollywood films. Very expensive camera, by the way. We fitted the camera with a lens that attaches to the end of a fiber optic filament, which we inserted inside the kaleidoscope. Once we placed the camera inside the kaleidoscope, we affixed a motor to the end that rotates so its internal crystals and oils would move in smooth, consistent transitions. So for hours in Seattle, Washington studio, we captured beautiful images and colors while filming against a black backdrop. The black represents the absence of anything physical, the place where we become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, and no time. This is the infinite black space or void that you learned about in chapter three. So as we recorded all the footage over the course of several days, gravity caused the crystals and oil to fall and accelerate with every rotation. So a technician had to tediously account for every second frame by frame to ensure the transitions were smooth. If the transition was not fluid, it risked breaking the viewer's focus or trans state. So it took months to refine our footage into the one hour video that we use during our advanced workshops. So finally, we had talented composer Frank Pischiati create the accompanying soundtrack and we wanted our students to be continuously mesmerized by the beautiful symmetry and changing geometric forms. And uh, okay, so I'm gonna pause here for a second before we go to the next section. The kaleidoscope is an absolute beautiful mesmerizing kaleidoscope. And when you are in the monastery and they have them in the jumbotrons, they've got three gigantic jumbotrons so that all thousand people have an equally good viewing throughout the instruction. And it is a gorgeous um, kaleidoscope like you've never seen before and very fluid. Um, I would say very somnambulistic. It's, uh, it feels really good. The colors are just gorgeous and it's a very pleasant feeling. Okay, in case any of you guys are wondering about that. So mind movies, the motion picture of your future. This is fun. At our advanced workshops, every participant receives a fun and easy to use software program called mind movies to make a movie about their future self and their life. So we use this in tandem with the kaleidoscope video. Depending on what the student wants to create in their life, the movie they make about their future exposes them to images and a specific written suggestions and information that are designed to assist them in creating it. Just like the shingles commercial helps you to read along. This could range from healing from a disease to strengthening their immune system, to creating a new job, manifesting new opportunities, traveling the world, attracting abundance, finding a new life partner, having mystical experiences and more. Its purpose is to remind them that if they can accomplish their dreams, create the uncommon and become supernatural, the goals of this personalized media presentation include helping students get clear on their intention they want to create in their future, two, programming their subconscious mind as well as their unconscious mind into that new future, three, changing their brain and body to biologically look like the future has already happened, Four, repeatedly associating those pictures and images with the music to create their neural networks in the brain and to emotionally recondition the body to a new mind. It's a way for them to remember their future. So the mind movie technology was founded by two business partners from Australia, Natalie and Glenn Ledwell. They are not only the founders, but also the poster children for its capabilities. Their journey began in 2007 when a friend showed them a movie he had created about his life. Later, he approached them with the idea of starting a business based on what would become Mind Movie Software. Getting the business off the ground required them to create a website to distribute the software so they could instruct people from around the world on how to make their own movies. Yet, they already had four businesses and knew almost nothing about the internet or e-commerce business. So Glenn could barely turn on a computer and Natalie hadn't even heard of YouTube. 
they recognized, however, that MindMovie had the potential to be a very powerful tool to help people build the belief that they could create real outcomes in their lives. So with that in mind, they decided to post a video about the power of mind movies on YouTube. At the end of the video, viewers were encouraged to visit their website where they could learn how to build their own. In early 2008, after receiving countless emails from customers telling them how mind movies had changed their lives, Natalie and Glenn decided to go all in. They flew to the United States, attended an internet marketing seminar and joined the marketing mastermind group and began planning mind movies global launch yet when they arrived in the united states they had nearly drained their bank account leaving almost no money to pay for the remaining services required to launch the business this meant learning mastering and implementing everything for the launch themselves so for months they worked 12 hours 12 hours a day out of their office, otherwise known as their bedroom. In the process, they ventured so far outside their comfort zone, they no longer knew what a comfort zone was. Faced with daily technical business and personal challenges, they had one secret weapon in their arsenal, their own mind movie. So in their mind movie, Natalie and Glenn defined the number of customers they wanted to attract and who those customers would be. They described the respect of the industry peers and plotted out what they would do once their business was a success. So, such as restaurants where they would eat and the family holidays they would take, finally they wanted to produce one million worth of sales. Why not aim high? They thought. Their marketing, their marketing friends were doing million dollar launches, albeit with $5,000 programs. They watched their mind moving multiple times a day to de-stress and remain focused and inspired, even though everything in their current reality seemed to be working against them. But they knew all their effort, risk, and dreams would culminate on the day of their global launch. The finish line was in sight. And then the unthinkable happened. Scheduled for September 2008, their launch coincided with the global financial crisis. Financial institutions around the world were facing cataclysmic losses, while families and individuals lost their savings, assets, and livelihoods in the worst downturn since the Great Depression. Meanwhile, Glenn and Natalie were facing their own financial hardships. By launching the business, they'd racked up $120,000 in credit card debt. If the business failed, they'd lose everything, their home, cars, investments, in addition to being buried under an insurmountable amount of debt. On the morning of their launch, unbeknownst to them, their email delivery system was down for scheduled maintenance. So none of their customers received confirmation emails for their purchase. By lunchtime, they had already received thousands of customer support email complaints in addition to challenges with their online bank. The bank wanted to freeze their account due to unusual activity. By evening, however, they had experienced the most memorable day of their lives. In the first hour on the first day, they had hit the $100,000 mark. And by the, dens, the day's end, they grossed $288,000 in the end. Glenn and Natalie ended up generating $700,000 based on a $97 program with no upsells. But the story doesn't end here. They were, of course, delighted with their achievement, but they faced one last monumental challenge. Because of the volatile and uncertain financial climate at the time, their bank froze their account so they couldn't access the money. This meant they couldn't pay commissions to their affiliates or the $120,000 they owed to creditors or deliver profit sharing to the people who had helped them launch the business. Everything hinged on their funds being released. Finally, after six months of sticking to their vision and watching their mind movie, 
they gained access to their account, lifting the financial burden that had nearly sent them into bankruptcy. But here's where the story gets really good. As the world was still reeling economically, the value of the US dollar against the Australian dollar was still grossly different. So thanks to the exchange rate, when they transferred their money back to Australia, they ended up earning an extra $250,000. With that, as well as with the commissions they received in exchange for promoting partner affiliate programs, Glenn and Natalie actually met their $1 million goal. The credit, they credit a huge part of their success with, they credit a huge part of their success, which was the complete opposite of what everyone else in the world was experiencing with the fact that they focused on their mind movie every single day. While this is a great example of the potential of mind movies, and while the options to create your own mind movies are endless, the process is relatively the same. Students first pick their song, one they will never tire of listening, Next, they choose images and or videos of either themselves or a future event and lay them out sequentially to tell a story of what their future looks like. Finally, we ask them to come up with specific words, phrases, or affirmations to add to the scenes which they superimpose over the images in the exact same way that TV commercials program people to be victims or to experience want and lack, mind movies can reprogram students to be unlimited in a life they're capable of creating. So in our advanced workshops, our students watch the Kaleidoscope video before they watch their mind movies because it helps them induce and sustain alpha and theta trans-like states with their eyes open opening the doorway between the conscious and the subconscious mind. Throughout their meditation, while in an alpha or theta brainwave state, they are more suggestible to their own reprogramming process. That is important because the more suggestible they are while using their mind movie, the less likely they are to become analytical and have constant internal thoughts such as, how is this going to happen? Or this is impossible. Or how am I going to afford that? Or it didn't happen last time, so why should it now? While the kaleidoscope induces students into trance to open the subconscious to programming, the mind movie is the new program. So mind movies program our students' subconscious minds the same way that television commercials program us, but in more positive, unlimited, and constructive ways. So when our brain's thoughts are silenced, the conscious mind is no longer analyzing incoming information. So as a result, whatever information we're exposed to in this state encodes directly into the subconscious mind. Just like we're recording or videotaping something to be automatically played back later, we're recording a new program in the subconscious mind. So a great amount of research over the years has documented how the, the right and the left hemispheres of the neocortex relate to one or another. We now know that the right hemisphere processes spatial, nonlinear, abstract and creative thinking, while the left hemisphere processes logical, rational, linear, methodical, and mathematical thinking. The latest research, however, also suggests that the right hemisphere processes cognitive novelty and the left hemisphere processes cognitive routine. So this means that when we learn new things, the right hemisphere is more active. And when the new learnings become routine, they're then stored in the left hemisphere. I'm gonna pause right here because one of the things that Dr. Joe Dispenza um, shared with us during our stay in the monastery is that Kandel did a research study where he showed that the neurological pathways of the brain and that the neurons, the neural networks fire and wire 1300, 1300 neural networks when it's something that is a habit. But when it's learning something new, just as your 
basically reading and being exposed to this information for the first time and it's new, you were firing and wiring double the neural network. So from 1300, you go to 2600 neural networks. So anytime you decide to engage yourself in learning new information, learning a new activity, you are becoming smarter because you are now firing and wiring 2600 neural networks instead of just 1300. Isn't that exciting? Imagine that's something you can choose to do every day. You learn this new information, you expose yourself to something new, you choose to memorize, you choose to adopt, learn, incorporate something new into your every day. You choose to use your left hand instead of your right hand to brush your teeth. All these things make 2,600 neural networks instead of 1,300 fire and wire. The sync and link, both sides of your brain. It's very awesome. So the majority of the people operate from the left hemisphere of their brain because they're hardwired into automatic habits and programs that they've memorized. So this is why language is stored in the left hemisphere because it's routine. You can think about the right hemisphere as the territory of the unknown and the left hemisphere as the territory of the known. So it makes sense then that the right hemisphere would be romantic, creative, nonlinear, while the left hemisphere would be logical, structured, and, and uh, logical. So it's methodical, logical, and structured. So we've actually seen this dual processing occur while watching our students' brain scans in real time. So because the kaleidoscope's flow of geometrical fractal, fractal patterns with patterns does not look like anyone, anything, anywhere, and anytime, its patterns are in fact designed to bypass the perceptual networks and associative centers in the brain that relate to known people, things, objects, places, and times. It's ancient geometrical patterns for repeating fractal patterns found all throughout nature. Thus, they activate lower brain centers. It's for this reason you can't look into a kaleidoscope and see your Aunt Mary, a bicycle you owned in the sixth grade, or a house where you grew, grew up, because you're not activating or triggering the associative centers related to memories, primarily located in the left side and the left hemisphere of your brain. So as you stop thinking and analyzing, start moving into the alpha, theta brainwave patterns, more activity occurs on the right side of the brain and the right hemisphere. So if the left hemisphere operates in the known, the right hemisphere operates in the unknown. So graphics 9A and 1, so 9A1 and 9A2 in your book, in the color insert shows brain scans of two students who are in coherent alpha and theta states. So in graphic 9A3, you're gonna see another student's entire brain in theta while viewing the kaleidoscope. Graphic 9A4 shows the brain scan of a student watching the kaleidoscope and the right side of your brain is more activated while they engage in the novelty of the experience during the trans state. So when we play the kaleidoscope in our advanced workshops, we play it in a dark room. So melatonin levels increase, thereby enhancing the brainwave changes. So I ask students to relax and consciously slow down their breathing. As their respiration slows down, so do their brain waves move from beta to alpha. I then ask them to continuously relax into their body and to get ever more in touch with it. I want to get them into the state somewhere between half awake and half asleep when they're most suggestible further priming their brain to accept the programming of their mind movie. Just as the late night infomercials influence people because the production of melatonin in preparation for restorative sleep causes their guard to drop, I want our students' melatonin levels to be elevated and their brain waves to be an alpha or theta so they can so they're wide open to the information and the possibilities in their mind movie. 
the soundtrack of your future life. Music has a way of calling up the memory of a specific time and place in our life. It's for this reason that entertainer Dick Clark said, music is the soundtrack of your life. The moment a magically nostalgic song starts playing, your brain begins recalling images of certain time and places, and those images connect you to the experience of different people and events. Neurologically speaking, the songs act as an external cue, causing a specific set of neural networks in your brain to fire. So by association, you see images in your mind that have been frozen in time. We call this an associative memory. And if you take the memory of that song further and really feel it, get into it, and maybe even sing and dance with it, you might notice that corresponding emotions connected to your memories begin to move throughout your body. Move and groove to the music. So whether the memory of that song relates to your first love, spring break, your senior year of high school, your senior year of college, Whatever you felt before walking into the field, before the biggest game of your life, every one of those memories is strongly embedded with feelings and emotions. And when you feel the emotion deeply enough, it connects you to the energy of your past. And the stronger the emotional response, the greater the memory. So in the moment you feel and experience that memory, it brings you to your past life. And in your mind, you are instantly transported through time into the experience. Just as it did in the past, your body comes out of its resting state, causing you to feel the same emotions of your past and reproduce a level of mind equal to the past memory. So for that moment, your entire state of being is in the past. Long-term memories are stronger when the amplitude of the emotions associated with the event is high. So whether a long-term memory is positive or negative, however, has no bearing on how our mind processes the memory. So for example, memories of traumas, betrayals, and shocking events carry equally powerful emotions rather than joyful. Once we, we remember and live the pain, fear, anger, sadness, and intensity of the emotions connected to those traumatic memories, our internal chemical state changes. This causes us to pay more attention to whomever or whatever created the original emotions in our external environment. So what if you could create a movie of your future and pair it with a song that motivates and inspires you so much that it pulls you out of your resting state changes your state of being and connects you to the energy of your future memories. You're basically mapping your way to the future and treating it as a memory, which your brain thinks now is the past. If music is the soundtrack of your life, then just as certain songs transport you to the past, couldn't you bring your future life in the same way? This is where my movies come in by purposely pairing very powerful and moving images of your future, adding words and phrases to reinforce the content and combining them with elevated emotions and inspiring music, you create long-term memories that move your biology out of the past and into the future. In other words, the images elicit feelings that correlate to the experiences you want to have in your future. This could include images of homes you want to live in, vacations you want to take, a new career, the freedom of expression, a healed relationship or body, interdimensional experiences, and so on. These are just some of the infinite possibilities that exist in your future timeline. When you watch your mind movie, as you connect to the feelings and emotions of your future, the emotions you feel and the more you pay attention to the images that created those emotions, now you're creating long-term memories of your future and you are bringing your future to life. The magical interdimensional component of the future is your song because it's the feelings associated with your song that change your energy equal to how you will feel. 
when that future unfolds, this is why it's best to choose music that's inspirational, motivational, or aspirational. Next, you add words of affirmation or knowing to the mind movie that remind you of who you are and what you believe about your future. You could even add a timeline if you want to. Some examples could include, one, the doors of dimension open to me so I may experience the mystical. Two, my body is healing every day. Three, my words are law. Four, I feel deeply loved and daily. Wealth flows to me. All my needs are always met. My body becomes younger every day. The divine appears in my life every day. My life partner is my equal and teaches me by example. Synchronicities happen to me all the time. I feel more whole every day. My immune system gets stronger each day. I lead with courage in my life. I am an unlimited genius. I am always aware of the power within me and all around me. I believe in myself. I embrace the unknown. When I call on spirit, it responds. So if you think of your favorite music video or a scene from your favorite musical, chances are you know all the words of the song as well as the images that correspond to every note, beat, melody, and harmony. Most likely the power of the combination evokes a time and a place in your life that was inhabited by a particular set of people, feelings, emotions, and experiences. And this is exactly what you're, you're doing with your mind movies, except instead of remembering the past, you're creating memories of the future. If you heard your song enough times while observing the images of your future, isn't it possible that when you heard your song without viewing your mind movie, you'd be automatically transported into those images of a new future? Just like you were transported to, you know, back to your past with practice, not only are you feeling the emotions that connect you to the memories of your future, but your biology is aligning to that future as well. You already know why this happens. If your body is the unconscious mind and it doesn't know the difference between the experience that creates the emotion and the emotion you create by thought alone, in the present moment, your body begins to believe it's living in that future reality. So since the environment signals the gene and emotions are the consequences of experiences in the environment, by embracing the emotions of the event before the actual experience, you begin to change your body to biologically align to your future in the present moment. So since all genes make proteins and proteins are responsible for the structure and function of your body, your body begins to biologically change to look like your future has already happened, putting it all together. Exciting information. So what if you invited a group of people to, to retreat from their lives for four or five days and in the process remove the constant stimulation in their external environment that reminded them of who they thought they were as their personality. I'm gonna pause right here because hello, pretty much the whole globe is on a retreat, a global health reset, if you will. So some people still are working. Um, a lot of people are not. So if you are part of the population who is not working right now or has reduced work hours, or maybe you're still working, but now you have a lot more time because you don't have to spend all that time in traffic driving to and from running around doing all sorts of activities that, um, you know, practices and yada, yada, yada. The point is we're all on a quarantine, lockdown, slow down mode and pace of life. This is like the perfect storm. There's so much opportunity right now. This being probably the biggest, first and foremost, you have the opportunity to become supernatural and to master becoming supernatural, master yourself, make radical, awesome, unexpected changes 
to your life. Wow. If you separated them long enough, you know, the places they go and the things that they do every day at the same time, they would be reminded of who they really are. Unlimited human beings. That's who you are, an unlimited human being. And if you spent the first day or two teaching them how to create more coherence in their hearts and their brains, and they repeated, repeatedly practice cultivating these states every day, it makes sense that sooner or later they would get better at opening their hearts, work more proficiently, and in fact, they would be more focused on a vision of a new future without being distracted. And at the same time, they could more easily feel the emotions of what that new future would be. And as they created more coherence between their brain and their heart, they would create more coherence in their energy fields. And this would create a clearer electromagnetic signature. And in turn, of course, your electromagnetic frequency fans out even greater and is more complete as we learned in the previous chapters. So as they continuously worked on overcoming themselves, their bodies, their environment and time slowing down and changing their brain waves to slower theta, slow your heart rate, slow your breath, slow your brain waves, unfolding into the unified field and transcending this three dimensional environment, it would become increasingly easier and more familiar for them to activate their heart center and to create pause right here. So no matter what the news is reporting, whatever the social media feeds are, the ads on YouTube, whatever things are causing fear, whatever the reports are on whatever disease, whatever epidemic, pandemic, economic, it's I like to call it yada blah, yada blah, yada blah, blah, yada, yada, blah, blah, yada. Yeah. It's like chatter, chatter, chatter. It's like, I don't know how many of you watched Charlie Brown growing up, but you remember when the teacher would enter the scene on a Charlie Brown um, cartoon, she would always show up and she would go, it was indistinguishable what she was saying. That's what all that chatter should be to you. You don't need to tune in to the news, whether it's in social media or any other forum or uh, on the internet or Twitter or it should all, those are all externals go within. This is a perfect, beautiful, golden opportunity for you to quantum leap. I really mean that literally you can quantum leap at a time like this. It is so, it is to say it's a golden experience is a monumental understatement. That's all I'm going to say. And despite anything that's going out in your external environment, I don't care what politician, what government, what economic, whatever the balance is in your bank account, you can transmute this. You can be an alchemist. You can turn base metal into gold. It's not out here. The whole point of this book is for you to recognize that it's in here. It's your God given birthright. And that's what Dr. Joe is trying to share with you this knowledge. And you can't say that you're so special because you're too young or you're too old or you're too anything. No one is too special to not be able to do this. I've seen kids as young as four or five years old do these meditations. And I've seen people as old as I think some of the older people in the monastery were in their at late 80s and 90s. Some of them had never meditated their entire lives and were just beginning to meditate. They just started meditating as a result of doing this work and this study. And they all started by, everybody starts by reading one of Dr. Joe's books. And of course you look up YouTube videos or some people find the YouTube videos first and then they decide, okay, I'm gonna buy that book, Becoming Supernatural, Breaking the Habit of Being You, You Are the Placebo, whatever. It doesn't matter which of the three I happen to start with Becoming Supernatural. And then as they saw testimonies, heard him speak more, they started to read and study the book. They're, I gotta get to one of his live events. 
And then you realize that there's other training you need to, you can't just go to a live event. You need to take other training before you can go to that live event because you need to have a certain amount of foundation. You need to do a certain amount of meditation. But even people who've never meditated before, they begin meditating once they started to involve themselves in this work that Dr. Joe teaches. And then, wow, the incredible things started to happen. If not now, when? If not you, who? So, as they continuously worked on overcoming themselves, their bodies, their environment, and time slowing down and changing their brain waves, unfolding into the unified field and transcending this 3D dimensional environment, it would become increasingly easier and more familiar for them to activate their heart center and to create. So after they practice getting beyond their body, emotions, habits, pain, disease, identity, limiting beliefs, analytical mind, and unconscious programs, by the time they practice of the mind movies was introduced, they would be ready to absorb a greater degree of information equal to who they were becoming, which would increase their ability to connect with their future. This is how we use mind movies at our workshops. So you can think of a mind movie as a 21st century version of a vision board, a tool used to clarify, focus on, and maintain specific life goals, except it's a dynamic instead of static thing. When used with the kaleidoscope, the mind movie technology is a great tool to help you bring your future to life by repeatedly experiencing it. It's also a great way to gain clarity on what you want to unfold in your life and to remind yourself on a daily basis what that future holds for you. This is called intention. Because mind movie technology is so versatile, it can be used across many applications and in a variety of settings. Not only can the technology be used to create relationships, wealth, health, careers, and other material items, it is also being used with children and teens to help them create a future vision so they feel they have some control over their lives. So many young people today are overwhelmed because of the frenetic pace, pressure, and demands of social media and modern society, of course. Suicide is a leading cause of death for teens in the United States. So the founders of MindMovie are using the technology in schools to help teens envision a brighter, more specific future for themselves. Mind movies are also used in corporate settings for team building and visioning. Entrepreneurs use the software to develop business, create mission statements and strategize and create business plans. So imagine a team of motivated people not only reading and intellectualizing their mission statement, but also seeing it unfold in a dynamic visual format before it happens. Integrative healing is another arena in which practitioners use this technology to help patients envision the healthiest version of themselves, assisting them with their healing process and keeping them on task with a new lifestyle that must be maintained daily. So this includes addiction treatment and recovery, facilities helping patients become clear on the future they wanna create in the next phase of their recovery. Mind movies have also supported the generationally unemployed in finding new jobs or careers or living, living more of a future oriented and productive lives and only for themselves, but also for their families. So as you can see, the applications for this technology really are endless. No matter how it's applied, the power of mind movies resides in enabling people to construct a new reality by reminding themselves of the daily choices they must make the new behaviors they must demonstrate, and the feelings they want to live by. So once you program these feelings and behaviors, subconsciously, you can break your addiction to old habits, familiar lifestyles, unconscious reactions. It's entirely up to you how to create what you want to get when piecing together your future. While any time is a good time to watch your mind movie, I suggest watching it first thing in the morning and right before you go to bed, because this is when you are most suggestible. If you watch it as soon as you wake up, you're starting your day off on a positive note by being mindful and focused on what you want to achieve for the day, as well as your future. 
when you view it at night before you go to bed, subconscious mind can contemplate while you sleep, align your body and mind to your future and come up with solutions that your autonomic nervous system can carry out while you sleep. Basically, you can use it anytime you need motivation or to make a different choice. The key is to make sure you're completely present when you watch it. Since implementing Mind Movies, I've seen our students manifest new homes and heard stories of home selling that had been on the market for years. I've seen vacations spontaneously appear and witnessed new relationships develop out of nowhere. I've listened to countless testimonials of abundance, freedom, new careers, new cars, healings of all kind, relief for unbearable hardships, and of course, profound mystical experiences that have permanently altered the recipients. But it's not magic or sorcery. It's not, it's simply learning how to become a conscious creator, learning how to align to your own destiny. Think of your mind movie as if you are turning on a radar device to track your future. Then as you repeatedly visit the future in your heart and your mind, all the thoughts, choices, actions, experiences, emotions, you experience between your present reality and your future reality become course corrections that deliver you to your target. So the more you keep your future alive with your intention and attention, energy and love, the more it starts to unfold as a new reality because you're remembering your future just as you remember your past. Your job then is to continuously fall in love with the vision of the future. Keep your energy up and not let circumstances or your environment, hardwired attitudes, familiar negative feelings or unconscious habits derail you from your goals. What makes this technology so profound is that we perceive reality based on pattern recognition, links between the neural networks in our brains and the objects, people, and places in our external environment. So for example, when you see someone you recognize, the neural networks in your brain instantly recall memories and experiences with that person. By contrast, if someone is not wired in your brain, you probably won't recognize them. If your brain doesn't have the hardware, familiarity with images, thoughts, and emotions from the mind movie installed before your future unfolds, if you don't have the neural architecture wired into your brain, how will you recognize your new partner, your new job, your new house, or your new body? Think of it like this. You can't open a Microsoft Word document on a Mac computer unless you already have the Microsoft software installed. If you can't feel the emotions and create the energy of your future reality, you might not recognize or trust that future unknown experience when it finds you. That's because your energy and emotional state are not in alignment with that experience. So instead of feeling certainty or unknowing, you may feel fear or uncertainty. So many of my advanced students have told me that they are on their third, fourth, or even fifth mind movie because everything in their previous ones has come to pass. They've come true. So I'm always amazed and humbled to hear the stories of how their creations came to be. No matter how varied their manifestations are, they share one thing. They trained the body to follow the mind toward an intentional future. This makes sense because if you have been putting in the time to study, memorize, and create the neural connections of your future, that is where you have been placing your attention. And as you know, by now, where attention goes, energy flows. Take a look at graphic 10 in the color insert. This shows an example of a student's brain activity while he is watching his mind movie. So look it up in your book. There's an enormous amount of energy in his brain because he is fully involved in the experience. Taking it one step further, getting dimensional. 
There is one final way we use the mind movie technology in our work. And once our students have neurologically mapped their entire presentation, I ask them to pick a scene from the mind movie and unfold into a particular space and time, experiencing that scene three dimensionally in their mind during their meditation. So if you notice, I never use the word visualize in my teachings. Visualization usually involves just seeing something in the mind's eye so it appears as a flat or two-dimensional image. For example, if you visualize a picture of a car, you will create a picture of a car. Instead, I want you to experience everything in the scene using all five senses so it feels like a real-life three-dimensional experience. But again, because I think this is really important. I ask them to pick a scene from the mind movie and unfold into a particular space and time experiencing that scene three-dimensionally in their mind during the meditation. If you notice, I never use the word visualize in my teachings. Visualization usually involves just seeing something in the mind's eye, so it appears as a flat or two-dimensional image. For example, if you visualize a picture of a car, you will create a picture of a car. Instead, I want you to experience everything in the scene using all five senses, so it feels like a real life, three-dimensional experience. Many people who have been introduced to my work have wondered why I spend so much time on becoming aware of the space around their bodies and the space their body occupies in space, as well as opening the focus to the space around their body and the space that the room occupies in space. Aside from the coherent changes my cues produce in the brain, it's all training for this mindful activity of pairing our mind movie with the kaleidoscope during meditation. So when a student begins a dimensionalizing process, before they see anything in their mind, they are instructed to unfold as an awareness into the scene. When they start, I want the participant to become aware that they are in their scene only as consciousness. This means they are not their body and they lack their senses. They begin as an awareness in the emptiness of space, as if they are incapable of seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, or smelling anything. Once they become aware that they are an awareness, I ask them to choose a scene from their mind movie, and this causes their brain to naturally start adding sensory input, which begins to bring the dimension to the scene in their mind. Next, they are instructed to start sensing what's to their right, their left, above them, below them. The act of sensing fills in the scene with three dimensional structure forms. I asked them to choose a scene from their mind move. This causes their brain to naturally start adding sensory input, which begins to bring dimension to their scene in their mind. Next, they're instructed to start sensing what's to their right, left, above, below, and the act of sensing fills in this scene with three-dimensional structures, forms, and space. As they expand their awareness to what else is in this scene, their senses begin recruiting other senses, further filling in the scene with forms, structures, curves, textures, sense, images, feelings, and space. Finally, when the scene, scene comes to life in their mind, in the future space and time of what scene they start inhabiting their body, and not that the body that is sitting in their chair meditating, but the physical body of their future. They are asked to feel their arms and legs, torso, muscles, and so on, until they can feel their entire body in that scene. Then they are ready to move about in the scene and experience that reality. My theory is that when they simultaneously activate enough of the neural networks assigned to the objects, things, and people in a specific space and time, their possibility of having a full-on holographic IMAX type experience increases. This is because as the student becomes present and unfolds into a fully dimensional scene, the large majority of the brain turns on. 
including the neural architecture that is allocated to both sensory feeling and motor involving and moving aspects of their body, as well as the proprioception awareness of the body position of where they are in space. The next thing they know, they are having a real life sensory experience of their future with their eyes closed in the present moment. So now take a look at graphic 11 in the color insert in the book, of course, it is the brain scan of a student who is experiencing a seeming, seemingly real mind movie seen in meditation. She has quite a bit of energy in her brain while she is dimensionalizing the scene. She described this moment as a full on virtual sensory experience. Her subjective experience was quantified objectively in the scan. And many of our students have reported that the experiences in their meditation were more real than any past external experience. Their senses were enhanced without external stimuli to excite their senses, yet all they were doing was sitting in a chair with their eyes closed. Many have reported that in their lucid experience, they smelled certain fragrances like colognes, the aroma of specific flowers like jasmine and gardenias, or the similar scent of leather in the new car they were sitting in. I've also heard students report specific memories like the stubble on their face from not shaving, the wind blowing through their hair, or the feeling that their body was filled with a powerful energy. I'm gonna pause right here. I think it was the second day that I was in the monastery and I remember smelling, I thought, oh, how cute. I thought to myself, I thought, oh, how cute they, um, they sprayed um, a mist to smell like roses. And I thought that they were doing that because since we were focusing on creating heart and brain coherence, and we were looking to get heart and brain coherence and connecting the heart to the brain and broadcasting out, you know, the feeling of love in preparation for the coherence healings that we were doing, I thought, oh, okay, you know, I'm like, oh, how cute. They sprayed a mist of the smell of ro you know, red roses because roses are synonymous with the feeling of love. And you know, the flower petals of a rose actually have the vibrational frequency of love in them. So I thought, oh, how, oh, how cute. Um, come to find out, not everybody smelled that. Apparently there was a few of us that smelled that, but they did not spray roses into the room. That was something that I was having as I was experiencing this meditation. So um, I thought that was kind of cool. So students have also given testimonies to, to specifics. I'm sorry. Students have also given testimony to specific sounds they could clearly hear, such as distant church bells coming from a European church near where they were vacationing or the bark of their dog when they were in their new home. Several students have also said that colors they saw were very incredibly vivid and clear, or they experienced amplified tastes like coconut, chocolate, and cinnamon, the combination of all the different senses literally created a new experience for them. It's our five senses that plug us into our external reality. Typically, when we have a new experience, everything we see, hear, smell, taste, and feel is sent to the brain through those five sensory, sensory pathways. Once all that sensory information makes it to the brain, clusters of neurons begin to organize into networks. And the moment the neurons string into place, the limbic brain makes a chemical called an emotion. Because of the experience enriches the brain and creates an emotion and creates an emotion that signals new genes in the body, in the rich sensory moment of a student's internal experience without ever using their external senses, they're changing their brain and body to look like the future has already happened. Isn't that what experience does? I love to hear a person who has just come out of one of those experiences telling me, you don't understand. I was there. I know it is going to happen because it already has. And I already experienced it. That's because the experience has already happened. So I'm going to pause right here because I think I mentioned in my, I think it was in chapter two, where I shared with you my experience where I had gone to uh, Vietri Sul Mari, which is on the Amalfi Coast in Italy. It's about three and a half hours south of Rome. I had driven from Rome to Vietri Sul Mari, and I went to a ceramics class, and I was going to be staying in Minori, which is a town 17 kilometers from Vietri Sul Mari. So when I was 
visiting Beatriz Lunari for my ceramics class, I parked in the parking lot of the Pornica de Ceramich, which is the place that I was taking the ceramic class. And I didn't even notice that there were gates that potentially could be closed. I just saw the open gates. I saw that there was a parking lot. I went and I parked, read the sign that said, you know, but, you know, it said that it was a ceramics place. And, um, and there were no other signs warning saying that these are the operating hours or anything like that. And as you know, from that particular, you know, I did play, I have not uploaded those to YouTube yet, but I eventually will, but I did play it for you all who watched and tuned into chapter two, where all of a sudden my car was unfortunately locked with a very unusual looking padlock behind these huge iron gates. My car and other cars were now locked in there and it was 913 at night and I needed to get my car out and there was nobody around, not a soul walking anywhere. And I'm like, oh, and by then I knew I could get it out using the meditation. The wild card always is you don't know how long it's going to take, but I know that I could get it out. And I thought, OK, yeah, it may take an hour, it may take two, it may take overnight. It doesn't matter. I know that I'm going to get it out with the meditation. So, but it's nine o'clock, nine thirteen at night. It's cold. I just wanted to. Meanwhile, you know, the hotel is waiting for me to check in. They're seventeen kilometers away. It's a thirty mile, thirty minute drive. So I needed. I had people waiting for me to check in, right? So, and I would prefer obviously to sleep in the comfort of a bed in my hotel than having to pull an all nighter. I wouldn't have slept out, not at, you know, outside. I would have just stayed awake all night because for me that's not a stretch. So I figured, oh man. So for a short, you know, once I did the meditation, I meditated for three minutes, no more than five minutes. And then I let it go. I knew it was done. I knew that I was going to get my car out. I just didn't know how long. And then I let it go. And in less than 15 minutes, these two men in an unmarked black Honda pulled up, went up to the gate, opened it, and boom, let me in. They never even acknowledged that I was alive, never made contact with me, eye contact, never said hi to me. I never said hi to them. It's as if I didn't exist, as if I were a ghost. And for all intents and purposes, they could have been two ghosts that were driving that black Honda. Boom, opened it, and then I was able to get out. So that's what he's talking about here. Because it's like the experience has already happened. It already happened in my head. I already created that outcome. And then it happened again. And once you've experienced it, it's not enough for it to experience, for you to experience it once. You'll experience it once and again and again and again and again. And you'll have a, a series of events that will happen closer and closer together where then you're going to go, okay, I get it. I know that every single time anything unwanted appears, I can use the meditation to create the wanted. And I can alchemize the situation. I can transmute, transform. I can change it, mold the clay of energy waveforms so I can turn them into the particles that I want because these this group of particles I don't want just the same in a state of everything being fine you can create and quantum create an even greater wonderful outcome for yourself in any one of the ways that we've already already read about in this chapter okay so when we fully experience a real a reality in this field of consciousness and energy without a body, the energy of the new experience serves as a template for a physical reality. The more energy you invest in your future and the more you keep experiencing and emotionally embracing it before it happens, the more you leave an energetic imprint in that future reality. Your body, sh and now your body should follow your mind to that unknown future because that's where your energy is. As you continue to place your attention and energy on it, you fall more deeply in love with it because love bonds all things. You are bonding with that future and it is being drawn to you. So for more information about Mind Movie or the Kaleidoscope, please visit my website at www.becomingsupernatural.com forward slash mind movies or www.becomingsupernatural.com forward slash kaleidoscope respectively kaleidoscope and the mind movie meditation so in our advanced workshops we instruct our students to create a mind movie before they arrive at our event 
so they can integrate their mind movies with the kaleidoscope video during the meditation. And we begin by getting heart centered, which you learned in chapter seven, locking into those elevated emotions for several minutes and radiating that energy beyond their bodies into space. Then we guide them in the following meditation, unfold into the present moment. And when you attain that state, open your eyes and stare into the kaleidoscope. Once in trance, switch to your mind movie. Spend maybe eight minutes with the kaleidoscope, then eight minutes watching your mind movie, and then repeat that cycle. When you've watched your mind movie enough that you can predict the next scene, you've mapped it neurologically. Over time, you'll associate different parts of the song you have chosen with the different images of your mind movie. Finally, spend seven minutes watching the kaleidoscope while just listening to the music from your mind movie. As you gaze into the kaleidoscope in trance and hear your song, by association, your brain automatically recalls different images from your mind movie. This causes you to further remember your future biologically, automatically, and repeatedly firing and wiring neural networks. Now your brain is being programmed to look like the new future has already happened, while the emotions are signaling new genes to biologically change your body in preparation for your new future. Watch the kaleidoscope in tandem with your mind movie every day for a month, or at least try to watch your mind movie twice daily. As soon as you wake up and right before you go to sleep, you might even want to keep a journal to record all the wonderfully unexpected adventures and serendipitous happenings that as you look back, you will see as points on a map that lead you to manifesting this future. Consider creating several mind movies, one for health and wellness, for example, and another for romance, relationships, wealth. So I would love to invite you guys to, especially you, the person who's watching this video at this very time and moment, thank you for tuning in. I wanna engage you and invite you to follow the instructions in chapter eight and to create a mind movie and to keep a journal for the next 30 days. We are just 50% into the book. There are very specific instructions, easy peasy to follow instructions. And I wanna say, if you don't wanna uh, purchase the whole mind movie thing, there are mind movies on YouTube that are generic that you can use that work equally as well. So you can do either or, you know, I prefer to do my own mind movie. So it has specifically things that are very tailored and I'm very specific uh, in my, when I write down my, my, my goals and so forth and the things that I want, I'm very, very um, specific. And uh, so I like my mind movie to be specific and custom tailored to me. But the generic ones work just as well. There's, there's a, a good number. If you need instruction on that, if you just put comments below and you want me to direct you to several of the mind movies, I believe I have them. Some of them are bookmarked already under the Dr. Joe playlist on uh, Love and Money Secrets TV. But if not, I can send them to you as well. So you just put something in the comments below that you're interested in that and I'll send it to you. And then you can start to watch the mind movies every morning, every night before you go to sleep. You can get the kaleidoscope from Dr. Joe's website. Just go to his website and you can, you can get that. And then you can start to up your practice with these new things and, and just keep a little journal. You can keep a paper written journal or you can do like what I have is I have um, notes in my, in my cell phone. And in addition to my dream diary, I have ten, tons of other notes. So you maybe start your kaleidoscope mind movie journal and you start to document all the different serendipities and coincidences i keep mine i have uh my notes are more for all all the ser serendipities and god incidents i've been doing keeping track of my coincidences and and god incidences for several years now because that goes hand in hand with a, another book that i'm writing called god incidences 
So, but that's neither here nor there. My point is I want you to be able to track this. And then as you do that for the next 30 days, it's really cool when 30 days from now you start to go back and then you start to look and read and review at some of the things you're like, you're like, wow, I forgot. It's amazing how much you forget, which is why it's so important to document it. And you'll start to be encouraged as things start to manifest for you. And it's so exciting. And it's funny how the human brain works, even in light of tangible evidence in front of you, our analytical, critical thinking brain doubts, oh, maybe that would have happened anyway. Or, you know, it doubts or it rationalizes. Here's another little insight. There's, again, more clues in language. When you rationalize, you feed a ration of lies to yourself. That's what rationalizing means. You're rationing out lies. It's better to realize, to make things real. As you become, so you are. Conversations with God, Neil DeWalt, he talks about, be that which you seek. And so, yeah, I want to encourage you. And I want to hear about your, your ahas, your insights. I want to hear about your serendipities, about the coincidences, about the neat signs, about the unusual signs. Even signs, sometimes you get signs, you're like, I know that's a sign. I don't know what it means, but I know that's a sign. When I was in, uh, in Malta, actually, when I was in Palermo, because I lived in Italy for six months, a little shy of six months, last year, as a matter of fact, and when I first got a pair of black sunglasses, I didn't re recognize that as a sign. It wasn't until I was in, I was in Sardinia and I got a second pair of glasses and in that moment, I knew that these two black sunglasses were a sign. And I said, whoa, as soon as I got the next pair of sunglasses, I go, those look almost identical in style to the first pair of sunglasses. They were the exact same shade of black, almost the exact same style. And I said, oh, this is a sign. The first pair of glasses and the second pair of glasses were assigned, but in that moment that I received the second pair, I now was aware that those black sunglasses were assigned. I knew that, that, that it was a sign that I was on the right track, but I knew that there was a greater meaning. So I figured, okay, I'm going to have to deal with this later tonight because I was in the midst of recovering a stole, a lost phone at that point, at that point. So... And that later was revealed to me. And all I did was when I got back then to my, to my room, to my apartment, I sat down and as I be began my meditation, I'm like, okay, divine, the great creator, what's this all about? What's, what's with the two sunglasses? And I'm like, what's with the two sunglasses? I had my own, I had just bought a pair of sunglasses in Colorado while I was on a business trip and vacationing over there before I came to Italy. So I'm like, I got a really cool pair of sunglasses while I was in Colorado Springs. So I didn't need any more sunglasses. Those were pretty cool, cool sunglasses. I liked them a lot. So why did you give me, I'm like, ooh, an extra pair of glasses that are cool, very cute. And then I had another pair of glasses and then it was revealed to me. And in fact, I'll direct you to watching a video. I did a video on on that, so you can you can watch that uh, at a later time, and I'll eventually put a, a link here in the description for this particular video. My my message to you is: pay attention to the signs. Write down the signs in addition to your same notes that you have on serendipity. You could do signs and serendipity, or serendipity and signs, serendipity and you know, and signals and whatnot. And then even when you don't know, you know, if you know what the sign means, then sometimes, like I said, you'll know that it's a sign and not know what the sign means. And other times the sign's meaning will be revealed to you sometimes minutes later, sometimes hours later, could be days or weeks later. And there's nothing wrong. You can go to YouTube 
actually not YouTube, go to Google and find out what the metaphysical meaning of X, Y, Z is. Sometimes you don't need to do that. Sometimes it might be, you know, like I had a, I just had a dream just last week, as a matter of fact, where in this dream, this, this silver spoon appeared. And I'm like, well, why would anybody aspire to that? Seems like an odd thing, you know, from a logical perspective, but these, these are not things that have to do with critical thinking or logic or intelligence. This is a higher realm. So in the dream, I had a silver spoon show up and it was apparently a very important thing. So when I woke up, I thought, well, it's kind of a funny thing that they would make such a big deal over this spoon being awarded and yada, yada, yada. And then I later realized, and I thought, well, I know, you know it has to do with feeding yourself. And then I realized that it had to do with abundance and prosperity in, in many different formats. So it's being fed and being provided for in a very abundant manner. And I thought, well, heck yeah, that's a cool sign. So I'm like, okay, I felt really good about that. I was like, hmm, during the, it was a lucid dream. So then afterwards, it was like, oh, yeah, as that realization came to being, I thought that was pretty cool. So that's it for now. We are officially a little bit over the 50% um, mark of becoming supernatural. Congratulations. In less than uh, 10 days, you have gotten eight, ch eight chapters done. We have uh, just finished this chapter. And thank you for tuning in, tapping in, turning on. And be sure to hit like. Right now, that would be nice. Like, share this with somebody that you know that might be interested in becoming supernatural. Hit that bell button so that you're notified as soon as this video is uploaded to Love and Money Secrets TV. We will have the more polished, edited version on Love and Money Secrets TV. And until then, oh, and of course, subscribe. Please do subscribe if you're into that kind of sort of thing. And I do love and appreciate you all and thank you for joining us today. So, ciao for now.